Hi everyone, welcome back to the Hero of Gallic Stone. It has been around a week since we last played, and I am I'm ready to get back into this. I'm excited. We were in um, the midst of a estate, wasn't we? Uh, uh, wasn't we? <laughs> Weren't we? Oh my god, wasn't we? Um, yes, literacy. Uh, you take a um, deep breath to get you for the. Yes, right, we were in the middle of a great estate and we were sent on a mission by um our, our, uh, our knight friend uh lady 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 gertrude no it's not lady gertrude yeah that's mm, that person anyway that one we were sent on a, uh, sent on our quest by that person who we shall not name because we can't remember her name um to steal a chalice and when we got there it wasn't there. It has been taken already to uh, to the place of the exchange, and uh, we are now panicking because we have to go get it. So let's do it. Let's get back in it. Let's go. Uh, you take it. Yeah. You take a deep breath to gather your thoughts and your options. Judging by the state of your house and the note, you doubt that Lord Berwick left with the chalice very long ago. If you are quick and lucky, you may still have time to get to the docks and stop him before he makes the exchange, whatever it may be. If you let him go through with it, you're quite sure the chalice won't end up in your hands. You've gathered the only evidence you can find. Fi there. God. <laughs> Sorry, you have to apologise to me. I'm not. Very, I'm not a bit ill this morning. Uh, so I'm uh, struggling. Anyway, let's go. Uh, you've gathered the only evidence you can find. Uh, you can find regarding Lord Beric's shady dealings. Do you really have any other reason to stay? Perhaps there is. Every moment you spend here means your chances of getting the chalice before it slips in through your hands permanently decrease. But that doesn't mean the risk isn't an acceptable one, right? There is no reason to stay, is there really? I'd love to stay, but I don't have any time to lose. The chalice is my first priority. The chalice and your mission from William of Halliford. Oh, it was William of Halliford gave us the mission. Not uh, Dame Mildred, as I now remember the name. <laughs> the chalice and your mission from William of Halliford comes before all else, as it should. Every second now you delay increases the chance that your quest will fail. You need to get to the docks, now. You slip out the same way you come in, back into the yard. It takes a few moments for your eyes to adjust to the darkness. The guards still stand outside the front gate, entirely unaware that you've just ransacked their master's house. You rush through the front gate at a dead run, leaving two confused guards in your wake. One of them shouts for you to stop, but by the time you hear her, you're already turning down the street that will take you to the docks. You run down the darkened streets of the Brightwall district as fast as you can, knowing that every second lost might make you a second too late. Before long, the wide, neatly cobbled boulevards of the wealthiest quarter of the city turn into the narrow, muddy streets of the remainder. Your lungs are already starting to burn. You push yourself to keep running, but soon you must stop leaning against the side of a half-timbered house as you regain your breath in ragged, half-choking gasps. If only your legs were stronger, your endurance greater. Now, you must pay for the weaknesses of your body with the precious time you spend recovering before you set off once again. Oh man, it's a bit harsh. Before long, you are sprinting into the maze of warehouses that surround Kendrick Stone's commercial harbour. Frantically, you run through every single wharf, taking valuable moments to look for the errant nobleman and his guards. If only you knew enough about the workings of the docks to know where the exchange would most likely be taking place. Finally, you turn a corner and see a dark figure in a fur-trimmed cloak of noble, of a noble, of noble. Fur-trimmed, yeah, they, w they wear each of a skin in this place. Finally, you turn a corner to see a dark figure in the fur-trimmed cloak of a noble, surrounded by the distinctive silhouettes of armed men and women. It's Lord Beric for sure, but his hands are empty. You crane your head round the corner for a better look, and your heart sinks. Sailing away from the dock it is a small skiff. On board are two or three dark figures. One of them is holding the chalice. You are too late. No, what? We failed! The chalice is beyond your reach now. Your mission has failed. No. Uh, however, you still have a lot of questions and very few answers. Why did Lord Berwick trade away the chalice in the first place? Why has he stopped paying protection money? Why is his house empty of servants or family? More importantly, is Lord Berwick running a smuggling operation, as your mistress seems to think? At the moment, though, the man himself seems rather disinclined to give you answers, surrounded as he is by four armed guards. If you could best them in combat or find some other way to neutralize them, though, you bet the nobleman would turn very cooperative very quickly. So what do you do? Hmm. I could step out to confront Lord Beric openly, try to find a way to sneak past. I retreat and report my failure in the morning. 
Um, I tried to find a way to sneak past. Is this wise? Yes, we're going to do it. We're going to try to sneak past them. Because we got past the guards. You quickly chart out an approach. All around the wharf are corners and alcoves cloaked in near complete shadow. One of them is no more than three paces from Lord Berwick himself. As quietly as you can, you move from one zone of shadow to the next. You almost get close enough. Almost. Damn it. You are still ten paces away when a particularly alert guard spots you in the open and shouts an alarm. The other guards will to face you, their hands reaching for their weapons. What? Lord Berwick turns moment before his escorts do. The thin, bearded man recoils in shock as his gaze takes in your weapons and gear. His eyes, already hectic with paranoia, narrow suspiciously. Guards! He shrieks, his voice laden with fear. An assassin! Defend me! You are no assassin. That is clear to your would-be opponents. They look you over appraisingly, their hands gripping their still sheathed swords. However, Lord Beric's paranoia appears to have gotten the better of him. Defend me! A gold coin to the one who takes him down! Coin gets the guards to do what loyalty to their master would not. These are, after all, hirelings. The four guards draw their blades and advance upon you. It looks like you've got a fight on your hands. It really does, because I haven't got any magic, and I, I can't bluff. I'm not smart enough. So we're going to fight them. I ready my staff to fight through the guard. I'm so fucked. The guards approach you as you ready your staff, too prepared to attack from head on, while the others circle around each side. You keep your assailants at bay with wide, twirling sweeps of your staff. The last thing you want is for the guards to close in and surround you. Should that happen, they will have the advantage both in numbers and in the fact that their swords are a lot handier and more agile than your staff. I should have bought a staff. I had a chance, didn't I? And I didn't buy one, and now I'm going to regret it. After a few moments, one impetuous guard tries to get through your defence. Bringing your staff around, you strike the attacker on the arm with bone-shattering force. The guard cries out in pain as her sword flies from her hand and she falls back, cradling her now-broken arm. Ah, oh, that's a bit mean. Only then do you realise that dealing with one attacker has left you open to all the others. Two more guards dart in, blades at the ready, attacking from opposite directions. Hastily, you bring up your staff to block one attack, then you feel the back of your head explode in pain and the world goes black. You wake up in a narrow bed in a dark room. Holy shit. For a few minutes you lie in darkness, regaining your wits and your memories. You remember the shimmer of bare steel against the starlight. You remember sharp blades cutting into your flesh, your strength fleeing your body. You remember falling. Shit. The door opens. Ah, good, says William of Halliford as he steps into the dark room, lamp in hand. You're awake. Wh what happened? You hear yourself replying. The well-groomed man pulls up a chair and sits down by your side. I'm afraid you were overcome by Lord Berwick's guards last night. The guards sought to bring you to the keep for a rest, but thankfully I was able to get you rescued. I also had a healer look at your wounds. Let it not be said that I do not guard the well-being of those who choose to work for me. You prop yourself and look up and look under your covers. Sure enough, the cuts you remember taking last night are gone, replaced with the faint telltale scars of wounds recently healed by magic. Suddenly, the blood seems to rush from your head and you begin to feel dizzy. Careful, William warns as he pushes you back down. You lost a great deal of blood last night. Healing magic can't restore that. You'll still be weak until your body can replenish it. He pauses. Tell me about the chalice. Were you able to recover it? You shake your head. No, it's gone, Lord Berwick traded it away. William sighs, and his shoulders sag. <sighs> How unfortunate. I had rather hoped to get my hands on it. I suppose I can't now. Lord Berwick made his payments this morning. He is under my protection again. The connection in your mind is obvious. Whatever the nobleman traded the chalice for gave him the means to pay back William of Halliford in return. It seems everyone made themselves a tidy fortune from the exchange. Everyone except you. The crime lord stands up again, shaking his head. I had hoped you would succeed where my agents were likely to fail. I'm afraid that, as extraordinary as your talents are, I appear to have overestimated them. With that, he turns to leave. Perhaps one day I may find another job for you, more suited for your skills. Until then, you'd best return to your knightly mistress and continue your lessons under her tutelage. Perhaps it would be for the best. With that, he is gone, and you are once again in darkness. Son of a bitch! <laughs> God! Oh, why did we fail? By mid-afternoon, you find yourself well enough to make your way back to the keep. Indeed, Dame Mildred is waiting for you in the courtyard when you return to the keep. Johnny Nero, have you made any progress, she asks, without any attempt, <laughs> pretense or small talk. Oh, oh. Johnny Nero, have you made any progress, she asks, without any attempt at pretense or small talk. You shake your head. I was able to find a few papers in Lord Berwick's study, but nothing conclusive. Mildred sighs. Ah, I see. I had hoped. She shakes her head. It doesn't matter what I hoped for. I've asked too much of you already. 
take a few days to rest and we'll be able to continue your training. With that, your mistress gives you a perfunctory nod and begins walking back to the guard room. Despite a lack of any, any kind of censure, you cannot help but feel that she is still angry with you. No, not angry. Disappointed. It's not a pleasant feeling to have. Winter continues onwards as you return to your duties as Dame Mildred's squire. The days become greyer and colder and full of snow, and yet the bandit attacks continue to worsen. Chapter 6 The Legacy of the Flowering Court You only need a single day of rest to recover from your nighttime adventure. Thanks to the efforts of William of Halliford's healers, all you really need is a full night's sleep to get you back on your feet. The next morning you set off to find more regular work. That week, Kendrick Stone sees its first snow of the year. Patrols are cancelled as the city and the forest around it are buried under a thick blanket of white. The forest, normally difficult, is nigh impassable to, save to, to any save the most proficient hunters and trackers. Yet even so, the bandit attacks seem to intensify. The victims are no longer just isolated travellers and small traders now. Entire merchant caravans are getting massacred on the roads and to, to and from the city. The tale is the same every time. The sight of a new raid is found, the guards riddled with arrows, the others cut down. There are never any survivors. Achievement! Ooh, fighter! Achieve! <laughs> As the months pass, your training continues. Your skill with the sword and shield continues to improve. Your body too grows faster, stronger, more agile. Despite this, you still can't match your knightly mistress, and every time you come close, you find some old soldier's trick to take you down. In the meantime, talk of the bandit attacks becomes a constant theme in the guard room. There is no question that when spring comes, the Duke will have to take drastic measures to see the raiders off. There is also no question regarding the effect that raids are having on the city. Without trade coming in, prices continue to go up, and your pay of 25 silver a month seems more paltry by the day. One by one, the stalls and the shops and the markets close down. One of the dozens of butchers, tailors and wine sellers who once sold their wares in the shadow of the keep, only a few remain. Their prices are extortionate, but you know you will find no better anywhere in the city. How much are you willing to spend for your comforts? First look up at his height price. Hey, I can afford to spend a lot of comfort. I save everything. Now is not the time to be a spendthrift. True. Now is not the time. I failed my last mission. With prices as high as they are, you know it would be obviously absolutely foolish to spend money on comforts and fripperies. Instead, you bear with the fraying edges of your tunic, bland meals and sour ale. You save your money for the day you truly need it. You still have a few hours of free time left to you as the sun goes down. How do you spend those scant few hours of leisure? Uh, well, I can't go to the tan taverns anymore. Uh, let's go back to the taverns again. Third time. Woo! We've got to get a lady friend, damn it. I, I could do some of this. But I, I want to. I run the taverns once again, looking for attractive companionship. Each night you seek out the brightly lit windows and laughter-filled common rooms of, of the ale houses and public halls around the keep. You've never been particularly good at introducing yourself, but it seems your reputation has already done all the talking for you. The stories of your previous deeds have filtered to the taverns of Kendrick Stone. Young men and women both gravitate towards you, pressing you for tales of your adventures. As awkward as you, eh. as awkward as you sound at times, like in real life, they are entranced by the retellings of your exploits. In such a cold and desperate time, you find solace in the arms of adventurous young ladies. Once again, they seem to gravitate towards you, hanging off your every word, smiling at every glance. How do you respond to such attentions? Do you seek only your own pleasure, or is it something more concrete you look for? Um, I want stability, I want peace, I want love. LOVE! <laughs> with things so unstable within the walls of the great city, you need someone to lean on, a source of emotional stability to help you through the double times. Yet, you find none. Again? Third time? Oh, for Christ's sake. There are dalliances, yes, but quick, furtive ones. Prices are rising, shops are closing, the bandits keep attacking, the food is running out. Nobody wants to commit to a relationship when such dire circumstances might tear it asunder at any time. Ultimately, you end up sharing your frustrations with Dame Mildred. Though surprisingly sympathetic, the knight offers only a few words of comfort and encouragement. They don't help much. Damn it. As the winter continues, prices continue to rise. Food, clothes, even protection. Apparently, the price of a writ of protection from William of Halliford has doubled to 100 silvers. Considering what happened last time, is this a price you are willing to pay? Um, how much money have we got? Du -du -du -du. Ooh, rumours and your tales of exploits are common topics. Nice. We've got expert prowess, lackluster will, lackluster substitute. So we're good with our prowess. That's good. We're compassionate. Compassionate and free. Uh, quarter staff, no armour. 
179 silver pennies. Okay, okay, we will do. We will buy a new rip. Oh god. Even without the warning you received so not so long ago, your first hand knowledge of what William of Halliford is willing to do to those not under his protection is fresh in your mind. You decide to play it safe. One evening you head down to the Crime Lord's opulent manse in the Brightwall district to pay for your security. You call upon the guard door and he ushers you to an office where you exchange your fistful of silver for a newly signed and sealed writ. That's a good boy, William of Halliford says as he hands the document over. Good thing you chose to do the right thing before we had to resort to any unpleasantness. You try not to think about what kind of unpleasantness the well-groomed man had in mind. One morning, as the snows finally begin to thaw, you come down to the guard room to find Dame Mildred arguing with another knight in hushed, angry voices. However, before you can approach or avoid them, one of the guards from the front gate steps through the door. Johnny Nero, he asks as he steps towards you and shakes the frost off his cloak. You nod. That's me. The guard hands you a folded parchment. Oddest thing happened. This letter came in on the wind. It blew right into my face, it did. The parchment is sealed, but not by a family sigil. It is sealed by some kind of strange symbol of a type you have never seen before. Ooh. <laughs> you tear open the letter. The message inside is written in heavy, somewhat clumsy strokes. Johnny Nero, I am told you are an adventurer of some skill. I require your abilities for a certain assignment. You will be well compensated. Eisen, court wizard of Leofric II, Duke of Kendrickstone. <gasps> The court wizard? What could he want with you? The wizard's tower stands at the confluence of the blue and silver branches of the river Colmere. It looms over the entire city, a vast edifice of stone and sorcerous energy scraping the winter sky. The only entrance is a vast, gently sloping stone ramp, wide enough for ox carts to travel to abreast, that leads to the tall, narrow door. You walk up the path, which is strangely warm to the touch and clear of snow, taking nearly fifteen minutes to reach the door. The grey expanse of the great market is far behind you. The rocks and the frozen waters of the Colmere are below, and the tower door looms before you. You step through the dark entranceway. As you progress, a faint blue glow lights up the thick darkness of the passage, gradually growing bright until the flares into radiance bright as day as you step into a massive drum-like chamber. In the very centre of the immense room sits a raised platform, wide enough to fit perhaps six or seven people. Step onto the centre if you please, booms a voice from above you, in an accent you've never heard before. Ooh, let's do an accent. <laughs> you immediately step onto the centre platform. A moment after you step on, the floor trembles and the platform begins to gently rise from the ground, taking you with it, high into the air. You have never met the court wizard of Kendrickstone before. In fact, you haven't even seen him during your nine months living in Kendrickstone. All you've heard are the rumours. Some say, <laughs> some say he was once a mighty general who led an army under the Corallanian Mansa. Expelled after a court rivalry, cost him both his position and the use of his legs. Others say it was a failed coup that sent him into exile. Still more say it was a magical experiment gone horribly wrong. Whatever the cause, his reputation was certainly great enough for Duke Leofric to invite him to become court wizard over a year ago. The platform continues to rise through a circular hole and into the chamber ceiling. Into the top part of the tower suspended over the base by some sort of powerful enchantment. When the platform stops, you are in the top chambers, and before you stand, before you stands the man himself, Eisen of Corylandis. He is haggard, overtired, and sleepless. That is the first thing you notice. You doubt he has seen a bed in at least two days. That, however, does not stop him from carrying himself with pride. Head tilted, just so, shoulders back, back straight, the very image of a Corylandian highborn. Even the complex contraption of brass and enchanted mud brick that has replaced his two human legs with four spider-hinged ones cannot rob him of his grace. Oh my god, that's fucked up. You are Johnny Nero, are you not? He asks. You nod. Good. Follow me. Master Eisen's laboratory is not a small room. Had it been empty, you could imagine a dozen or so people sitting comfortably within. However, on this morning, it is emphatically not empty. The room is a maze. Stacks of books, piles of notes, and strange instruments glitter the floor, leaving only a few twisting passages where the stone floor is still visible. The court wizard picks his way gingerly across the vast but carefully stacked mess. You follow him as best you can, trying not to tip over any of the precariously arranged piles of papers. Eisen stops as he reaches a large stone table in the corner. Its top is dominated by an enormous apparatus of brass, steel and black glassy stone. Both the desktop and the great machine glow with runes of blood and red, a series of lenses 
A series of lenses? A series of lenses nestled in the device's brass arms, lined up with a vast, complex pattern of circles carved into the polished stone tabletop. Tell me, boy, the wizard asks, what do you know of the flowering court? I know a little bit, you reply. For the next few minutes, you tell the court wizard everything you know about the once powerful, long-vanished sorcerous empire that once ruled the land in which you now live. By the end, you are even citing what few snatches of legend and myth you know about the long-disappeared civilization. I see, Eisen says finally. You know enough, then, to understand why the task I am about to set you is of such importance. What task is that, you reply. You still don't know what the wizard wants for you. Instead of replying, the wizard asks you another question. What do you know about my predecessor as court wizard? You admit that you know almost nothing at all about him, seeing as how Eisen's predecessor left well before you arrived in Kendrick Stone. Since your arrival, you haven't heard anyone in the city bring up the previous court wizard, either. There is a reason for that silence, Eisen replies. My predecessor was run out of the city by the knights of Kendrick Stone and an angry mob. That's horrible. Why would they do that? There had to be good reason if the knights were behind it. Yeah, I'm going to stand up for my knights. Eisen nods, his mouth a hard slash across his face. There was a reason. A very good one. As far as I can tell, the wizard explains. My predecessor was obsessed with his research. This is not necessarily a bad thing unless that obsession bends all other things to its will, including morality. So, when his obsession demanded the flesh and spirit of living creatures, rats, dogs, children, my predecessor did not make the same decision to step away. Eisen shakes his head angrily. Instead, he made those sacrifices wholeheartedly. The wizard meets your gaze, his eyes blazing in a tightly controlled anger. My predecessor was a monster. What the Duke's knights did to him was a mercy. Why are you telling me this? You reply. What does a disgraced wizard have to do with anything? Eyes and sighs. I am telling you this because for the past year I have been reconstructing his research. It has not been easy. It has taken much time and effort to find a way around the need for live sacrifices. But I believe I have found a way. All I need is one more thing. And that's where you come in. Oh my god. My god. We're gonna, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. We're gonna leave it there. I don't want to go any further, because we're gonna get involved in another mission by sounds of things. And we want to leave that for next time. So what did we do? We, we, uh, we failed, <laughs> is what we did. God damn it, we failed to get the chalice. Um, uh, we failed to show that he was running a smuggling ring. We basically, we completely fucking turded all over that mission, didn't we? Oh well. Oh well. I'm sure we can uh, we can make amends for that um, in with whatever this court mage wants us to do, surely, even though we haven't got like any magic at all to our name. So this is gonna be this is gonna be difficult, but interesting. And I look forward to doing it next time. Um so I'm gonna leave it there. Thank you for watching. Leave a like if you like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe if you enjoy all my other stuff and uh, want to see more and I will <laughs> once again see you next time